Okay, gang, it is time to bring this last lecture to a conclusion. And um, we are going to begin uh, the beginning of the end for beta oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation and fatty acid metabolism. Um, so I had originally planned on just kind of being uh, tough on you and letting you fend for yourselves on trying to understand the electron transport chain, but then I realized that um, not everyone here has um, had biochemistry in the past, and many of you may not remember the electron transport chain. Um, some of you might remember it in great detail, especially if you had my exercise phys class. So cooler heads prevailed, and I thought that what I would do is um, give you guys an opportunity to truly understand the electron transport chain, and I brought in an animation from a previous class. So um, while you are looking at the slides, I am going to ask you to uh, know this slide. I'm going to ask you to know all these pieces here, and more importantly, what they do, and um, what they would not do in the case of malfunction. Um, or what they might do in the case of exercise. So don't just memorize the pieces, uh, understand the concept. So what I'm going to do is bring in a lecture that I had done uh, for physiology that not only talks about this in great detail, but also will kind of back up a little bit and talk um, about the citric acid cycle and beta oxidation and just kind of go through this whole process again to really reinforce this for you guys because I, I do realize this is difficult content. So um, this and this and this uh, conceptually will all be included on um, the upcoming portion of this lecture. So immediately following this, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit, go into the Krebs cycle, go into beta oxidation, and then go into a lot of detail on the electron transport chain. So, um, and it's going to be animated. So I'm going to kind of just say, you know, for the sake of your slides, understand this information, understand these components here, and then um, watch my animations and take a lot of notes. So now we're going to talk about the actual Krebs cycle um, or the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle. Uh, it's, they're all synonymous and you can see it over here on this side. Uh, pretty complex looking system. Um, we're not going to go that deep into the complexity though at this point. If you guys take biochemistry then we will certainly go into it there. Um, Basically, this is the second major step in oxidative phosphorylation. Um, because there are passing of electrons in the Krebs cycle, and there is NADH being formed, and NADH um, being oxidized, um, this is considered an oxidative phosphorylation pa pathway. Um, we know that after glucose breaks down, um, we get this three carbon molecule, which we call pyruvate, and you guys can see that glucose is here. And then glucose gets broken down into pyruvate. And then pyruvate dehydrogenase will convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Um, and that is a very important step in this process. Um, and most importantly, the Krebs cycle basically transfers the energy from these molecules to electron carriers. So everything that is occurring here uh, all the energy that is being uh, extracted from the breakdown of glucose and pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, it's all transferring that energy into these NADH pluses. I'm sorry, NADHs. So you can see here, you can see here, you can see FADH2 is being formed. Um, GTP is also being formed, which can be converted into ATP. So you can get one ATP out of uh, one GTP. And um, if we look at this, this cycle here, we can see that we get one NADH, two NADH, one ATP, one FADH2, and another NADH. So we get three NADH and one FADH2. And again, that's potential energy that is ultimately going to go down into the electron transport chain to produce ATP. Um, and this system is important because this is where carbohydrates go when they are metabolized uh, aerobically. So again, if we have glycolysis occurring, 
and pyruvate enters the mitochondria. Well, in the mitochondria, there is oxygen present, so therefore it's going to be in an, in an aerobic uh, metabolic pathway. And uh, so pyruvate can go in uh, and be metabolized. And we can also get fats and proteins that come into this uh, particular system here to be broken down uh, into potential energy. And you can kind of see that happening here. So um, again, this this system, this Krebs cycle, this citric acid cycle, this TCA cycle, um, it is in the mitochondria. And basically we can have glucose oxidation, fatty acid oxidation, and protein oxidation that will all occur here. And most important thing to understand is that they all have to be converted into this acetyl-CoA. So this is the particular molecule that is recognized by the Krebs cycle. So if these things are not being converted into what is recognized by the Krebs cycle, then they can't be metabolized and we won't generate that potential energy. So there are some diseases that exist out there or some hiccups in metabolism where um, we don't have this conversion that happens. And if this conversion doesn't happen, then we have a major loss in potential energy. And that can have pretty severe ramifications on systemic physiology. Um, so the Krebs cycle is happening in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so make sure you guys understand um, where that is. And I have a picture a little later in a, another slide that will kind of give you an idea of where that's located. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's occurring to generate these NAD and FADH2, uh, which will directly generate uh, ATP in the electron transport chain. So if we have glucose coming in as pyruvate and pyruvate entering the cell, or I'm sorry, entering the mitochondria uh, to generate ATP, it will first generate NADH and FADH2, and then later on in the electron transport chain, those carriers will help generate ATP. Same thing with fatty acids, same thing with proteins. They'll all be converted into this recognizable molecule. Um, we will generate NADH, FADH2 through the Krebs cycle, and those will be used to generate uh, ATP directly at the electron transport chain. Um, and this is just basically further um, clarity on how important it is for acetyl-CoA to be um, used in the citric acid cycle, so in the Krebs cycle. Um, so this is our key molecule in generating those electron acceptors. Um, here is another representation of what I just showed you guys. Um, this is a linear representation though, so, and I have these, these bullets up here that we'll go through in a moment. So. Um, we talked about pyruvate, a three carbon molecule produced in glycolysis. So here's a cytosol. Pyruvate will um, enter the mitochondria. This is a um, enzyme complex that will help convert it to uh, acetyl-CoA. So when pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA, which you can see here, acetyl-CoA is a two carbon molecule. In that process, we generate one NADH. Okay, so what is invested is up here. So the investment phase is all up top here above the line. Okay, let me just quickly kind of go through the slide so that you know exactly what we're looking at. Here's what's invested. Okay, so these would be the oxidized forms of NADH plus and the oxidized form of FAD. And then there's an ADP here and a phosphate. Um, and what this line represents, because some people had questions about this in class, this is just a linear representation of what is happening in this cycle here. All right, so I thought some people might appreciate this picture a little more. Okay, so again, we have pyruvate. It enters, it enters the mitochondria. It gets converted to uh, acetyl-CoA. So we have a three carbon molecule that gets converted into a two carbon molecule. And we know that we lose a carbon because we can see it here being uh, lost as CO2, okay? we also gain uh, one NADH. As the acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle, we basically start to generate these potential energy molecules here. So we have three NADH that is produced. Okay, that's really good, rich potential energy. Uh, we have one ADP that is converted to an ATP. And then we have one FAD 
which is converted to an FADH. Okay, so when one pyruvate goes through this system, we generate all of this robust potential energy. Okay, and um, this is just kind of like the the most important part of understanding what is generated in the Krebs cycle. Um, and this is just kind of reiteration, just telling you how important these things are in generating energy, okay, specifically in bioenergetics and metabolism, um, because they also can play a role in activating um, enzymes in the cell, which also um, can produce free radicals. So uh, they can, FADH and NADH uh, are, are great molecules for generating energy, but they can also be detrimental in activating enzymes. Um, in a disease condition that will be detrimental to the cell and the environment of the cell. Um, so here is a, a little more detailed picture of what happens in the Krebs cycle. Um, and I'm going to have a, a quick layout here of some, some carbon dynamics. So um, the C represents carbon. So we know that pyruvic acid, okay, or pyruvate, um, is a three carbon molecule. And we know that, that that is converted to acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon molecule. So we have pyruvate here. We have the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which is right here. You can see, just like on that other picture I showed you, we lose a CO2, so we lose a carbon. And now we have a two-carbon molecule, which is the acetyl-CoA. Um, acetyl-CoA is now going to combine with acetate. Um, which is this guy here, okay? So um, oxyl acetate is a four carbon molecule. So you can see here that it's a four C, four carbon molecule. And this is essentially going to, if you follow my cursor here, this is going to interact with acetyl-CoA, which is two, and it's gonna create citrate. And citrate will then be a six carbon molecule because we get two from acetyl-CoA combining with four from oxyl acetate, and that makes a six carbon molecule, okay? Now the rest of all of this is unimportant. If you were in biochemistry, we would talk about all of this. All I wanna really focus on is citrate all the way to oxyl acetate, okay? So citrate um, will then be metabolized to oxyl acetate again. Okay, and that's why we call this a cycle, because this cycle will just kind of keep, as long as pyruvate and acetyl-CoA is coming in, this cycle will continue to just regenerate itself, okay? Um, in this process, we lose two CO2, and we'll talk about what sort of ramifications that has on the molecule, and um, most importantly is when citrate is generated, we can then generate a lot of this NADH that you saw on the previous slide. We have FADH being generated and NADH being generated here. So you can see that the um, oxidized form, NAD+, will become reduced in this process and produce these high energy electron carriers. Same thing happens here. Oxidized NAD+, gets reduced into NADH. The FAD, oxidized version of FAD, gets re reduced into FADH2. And then again, we have the same process where oxidized NADH gets reduced into NADH. I'm sorry, NAD plus, that's a tongue twister, gets um, reduced into NADH, okay? So to give you um, a little more of a visual on this process, I created this and uh, I, I hope it works. I'm gonna quickly Take a drink of water, hang on. Okay, um, so pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. I put three little circles up here. And we know that when pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA, we lose a carbon, and you can see that here. And then we're left with this two carbon molecule. Okay, if we look at oxyl acetate, we know that that's a four carbon molecule, one, two, three, four. If we follow this arrow here, oxyl acetate recognizes acetyl-CoA because of its carbon structure and it's attracted to it. It wants to gravitate towards it. So it will basically in this cycle, it will 
create a formation with acetyl-CoA, and now we have this six carbon molecule, okay, which is citrate. Now, um, citrate will be metabolized, and we will get one NADH, and we will get one CO2, okay? So if we have a six carbon molecule, and we have the loss of one CO2, then we're left with a five carbon molecule, okay? Um, this five carbon molecule will undergo further metabolism, further breakdown, will generate uh, another NADH, and as you can see here, we lose another CO2. So what's going to happen? Well, this five carbon molecule is then going to turn into a four carbon molecule. Um, and we will also generate one ATP. So I'm going to bring the five carbon molecule over here to the left. There it is. Okay. So we have this five carbon molecule. And of course, as I showed here, we lose one more CO2. All right. So what's going to happen is we lose another carbon and we're left with this one, two, three, four, four carbon molecule. So, and as we identified earlier uh, in this slide, this um, oxalacetate product is a four carbon molecule. So now basically this will enter the cycle again. So the next pyruvate that comes down will turn into acetyl-CoA. Oxalacetate, which is this four carbon molecule, will recognize it. It will bind and make a six carbon molecule, and around and around we go. Um, it's also important to identify that um, through this process, we develop FADH and then we develop NADH. Okay, so then this four carbon molecule is ready to go into the system again. Okay, so that's just kind of a visual to show you guys uh, what is happening there using these actual carbon molecules. And I have no idea why the hell this one was over here. So that's was supposed to be over here and drop here. But what, what are you going to do? Uh, okay, next slide. So this is basically a reiteration of what I just showed you guys. It's almost the exact, oops, almost the exact same set of slides but I broke this down into a much simpler picture for you guys. Um, and this I expect you guys to be able to draw on your exam. So we have acetyl-CoA and you guys, that is a two carbon molecule as I showed you on the previous side. Here we would have um, oxalacetate, which is a four carbon molecule. We know that uh, oxalacetate will bind to acetyl-CoA, creating a six carbon molecule. Uh, we will lose one CO2, which will create a five carbon molecule. In this process, we also gain an NADH, okay? Uh, the five carbon molecule will get cleaved again. We'll lose a CO2, which will leave us with a four carbon molecule. In this process, we gain another NADH, and we gain a GTP, which is converted into ATP. And then from oxalacetate back to acetyl-CoA, we generate uh, FAD. H2 and an NADH, okay? So um, at this particular point here, we have oxalacetate again, okay? So we started with four carbon. We met the two carbon to create a six carbon. The six carbon gets cleaved. The cleaving is necessary because that's what creates CO2 and also creates the um, electron carriers to basically accept the electrons and bring them to the electron transport chain. We have a cleavage again. We lose one carbon, so we have a four carbon molecule. That helps create more energy, more potential energy. We gain an ATP, and around and around we go. All right? So this part here, you can read on your own. This is basically an overview of everything we've talked about so far from glycolysis to now. Um, you know, we can even look at this part of the cell, up, or I'm sorry, this would be the cell membrane, so we can even consider this the bloodstream up here, and you guys know everything on how insulin gets... Uh, glucose into the cell. Once glucose gets into the cell, you know it's a six carbon molecule, right? We've talked about that. Um, when glucose undergoes glycolysis, we are create two pyruvate. Now, if we were exercising, um, this pyruvate can get converted into lactic acid. Let's just say that would happen over here, right? In this particular area here. Um, and then uh, that would be anaerobic glycolysis because the glucose molecules that were produced, um, which is peru pyruvate, is being converted into lactic acid um, in an anaerobic capacity. So that means that no oxygen is present. 
Um, we also knew we also know that through glycolysis we start to generate these high uh, energy electrons, which are carried by NADH and FADH2. Um, those carriers will bring those electrons and those hydrogens down into the electron transport chain, but it will not do it directly. It will have to pass those hydrogens and electrons through those uh, very highly regulated uh, shuttling systems like the uh, malate aspartate shuttling system. Okay. Um, we know that pyruvate can also be metabolized aerobically, so that would be aerobic glycolysis. The pyruvate, the pyruvate can go into the mitochondria. When it goes into the mitochondria, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA, right? That's that two-carbon molecule. Here's that oxalacetate here. So that's that four-carbon molecule. These two will these two will hook up, right? They'll do Netflix and uh, and cuddle and watch a movie and hook up, right? Well, isn't that what you guys say now? Like Netflix and chill. That's like the the hookup lingo. So these two hook up. They have they they watch Netflix and chill, and um, basically they create citrate which is this six carbon molecule. And basically this will be cleaved back into another four carbon molecule. And this process will create more of these um, high energy electrons, which will be received and accepted by NAD plus and FAD, right? So when they accept those electrons, they get, they get um, reduced to NADH and FADH2. So, and those carriers, if we follow this blue line, those carriers will also get down into the electron transport chain and donate them to create ATP. Okay, so that's that's where we, we kind of are now. So this is the big picture. So if you guys uh, really want to study and really want to understand the concepts of everything we've been talking about, it's kind of all in this slide here. So if you walk yourself through this, um, you'll understand how all these things interact with one another to, to generate energy. Um, okay. So, uh, basically now that we have talked about the Krebs cycle and you know, uh, what glycolysis in the Krebs cycle does, um, now we're going to talk about the payoff. We're going to talk about why we have been focusing on these, uh, reducing agents, these, um, coenzymes NADH and FAD h2 why they're so important um, so before that i want to just quickly go over just a brief anatomy of the mitochondria so the mitochondria is composed of two membranes we have an outer membrane which is represented here if you follow my cursor and then we have the intermembrane which is here okay and what I have in the intermembrane here is the electron transport chain. So we can see the protein complexes, we can see ATP synthase, and we'll go over all this uh, in a moment. And then most important is the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So this is the inner membrane space, and this is a very, very, very important space to help us generate ATP. So if we look at the big picture of the mitochondria, which kind of looks like a kidney bean cut in half, um, we can see the outer membrane here, okay? So, and that basically is represented here. And then we can see the inner membrane here, okay, which is represented by this image. And then we can see the matrix, okay? The matrix is this space inside, okay? So this would be the inner membrane, the outer membrane, and then in here is the matrix. And the matrix is where the magic happens. Okay. So, and the matrix would be represented in this space here where you can see the matrix. And look at what else is in the matrix. The Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle. So make sure you guys understand where these, these um, cycles are within the cell itself or within the, the organelle itself. Okay. So I uh, created this animation, and I hope this really helps drive home the message um, for what the electron tra transport chain does and how it works. So the electron transport chain is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? So this would be the cytosol. This is where glycolysis is happening. This would be the outer membrane right here. This would be that inner membrane space. And uh, this is the inner membrane and, of course, the matrix, 
Okay, and the matrix is where the Krebs cycle is happening. So the electron transport chain is composed of four protein complexes, one, two, three, four, and it's also composed of two coenzymes that are uh, mobile, they can move. So these are actually embedded, the protein complexes one through four are embedded in the membrane, they can't move, but these coenzymes, which is coenzyme Q and coenzyme cyto C or cytochrome C, uh, these are mobile and they can move uh, within the membrane here, within the inner membrane. So let's direct our attention first to protein complex one. So protein complex one uh, interacts with NADH, okay? So we can see that when NADH interacts with this complex, it becomes oxidized and its electrons are released. Oh, my phone's ringing, I'm going to ignore that. When its electrons are released, um, basically, they are going to be processed through the protein complex one. So you can see that protein complex one is going to process those electrons. And that is what starts to create what we call an electron current. Okay, so protein complex one is an electron acceptor, it's going to take the electrons, it's going to process it, and it's going to start creating this current. Now also, this complex one is also considered a proton pump. So the hydrogens that are associated with NADH are going to be pumped through this complex into the inner membrane space. And this is a very important process. So um, this is a proton pump. So when NADH interacts with um, protein complex one, we have the removal of the electrons. The electrons is processed by this complex. We have hydrogen being pumped from the matrix into the inner membrane space, and um, that is step one. Now, interestingly, if we look at um, this uh, coenzyme, coenzyme Q, this is going to interact with the electrons that were processed by um, by the the. Uh, hang on one second. Hang on, I gotta answer this. Hello. Hi. Uh, are you here right now? Are you Are you here now? Oh, okay. Um, I'm I'm actually doing a lecture online right now. Yeah. Can I call, Can I call you back in like fifteen minutes? Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, I'm back. So uh, let me try to figure out where I was. Of course, um, when I'm giving you guys a lecture, my phone never rings. I, nobody ever wants to talk to me. And the one time I uh, am trying to do a lecture with you guys, I get interrupted. Uh, let me take my water here. Okay, let's get back to this. So uh, what is important to understand... I could go back and edit that, but I'm not going to do it. So we're just going to keep this raw. Um, what is important to understand is that the electrons here are going to interact with this coenzyme Q. Okay. So this complex one takes the electrons from NADH, processes the, processes the electrons, creates this current. The electrons are going to communicate with this um, coenzyme Q, and the hydrogen is going to be pumped up into the inner membrane space. Okay, so now what happens is this second complex, and this is, this is kind of cool. Um, this second complex only communicates with FADH. And what's interesting about this complex is it doesn't go through the entire membrane. If you look at complex one, three, and four, those are all transmembrane protein complexes, which means they communicate with both sides of the membrane. So protein complex one, um, can communicate with the inner membrane space, and it also has a section of it that is in the matrix. So um, it can make things happen on both sides of this membrane right here. On the protein complex two, um, it only can communicate with the matrix. So it doesn't have a portion of this protein which can interact with the inner membrane space, which is kind of neat. Um, so 
FADH2 is going to interact with protein complex 2. It's going to be um, oxidized. And basically what's going to happen is protein complex 2 is going to release the hydrogens from FADH. And those hydrogens are going to be stuck in the matrix. And that's a really important uh, caveat to this system. Okay, It's also going to remove the hydrogens, just like we saw in protein complex 1. And it's going to pass these hydrogens through the protein complex 2. Okay, further creating a greater electronic or electron current. Okay, and what's going to happen now is this guy, this Q, coenzyme Q, that picked up the electrons from uh, the first protein complex is now going to pick up the electrons from the second protein complex. All right, so protein, the coenzyme Q is going to carry or transport the electrons. That's why we call this the electron transport chain. Okay, so it has the electrons and it's going to now dump those electrons off at the cyto C location. Okay, so now it's going to communicate with this guy and it's going to basically transport those electrons to cyto C and now cyto C has the electrons. Now it's very important to understand that this protein complex is not a protein pump or a proton pump. You see how this one here was transporting protons into the intermembrane space? This guy can't do it because this protein complex does not interact with the intermembrane space. So those hydrogens are left in the matrix. Okay. Now with the cyto C that has the electrons from both protein pump one and protein two, it is going to communicate with protein complex four. And here it's going to unload the payload, which is the electrons. But before it does that, protein pump three is going to take these hydrogens and it's going to put them into the intermembrane space. Okay, so one and three are protein pumps. Two is not. Two is generating the hydrogen so that these pumps can keep pulling hydrogen and putting them into the intermembrane space. Now, once we get to the protein complex four, uh, cyto C is going to drop off the electrons and the electrons are going to go down the protein complex into the matrix. It's going to look like this. Now in the matrix, we have molecular oxygen and molecular oxygen is going to be attracted to these free electrons. And when the electrons and the molecular oxygen interact, we're going to have the creation of H2O. So essentially, um, water is a byproduct of ATP generation. Now also what is going to happen at this uh, protein complex four is we're going to have another hydrogen or series of hydrogens being pumped into the uh, intermembrane space. Now what is so important about this gradient of hydrogens that we're generating and we're pumping into the intermembrane space is it's creating this environment that is uh, very positively charged. Okay versus the matrix, which has less of a positive charge, okay? And this is gonna play an important role in generating ATP itself, okay? So we have an excessively positively charged um, intermembrane space, and here we have uh, less of a positive charge, which is gonna create this gradient up here of hydrogens. Now on this next picture, I'm gonna show you, it's the exact same thing. Um, I have, you know, I, I have the processes kind of spelled out a little bit, um, but we're going to add a new player here to this to this process, and that is this ATP synthase. Okay, ATP synthase is the last protein in this uh, electron transport chain, which is going to directly generate uh, ATP, and that's why all of these uh, NADH and FADH have been so important because they're contributing, you can see here and here, they're contributing to the development of ATP production in the mitochondria. So what happens is we have all these hydrogens that were pumped up into um, this space here. And these hydrogens are going to follow their concentration gradient down ATP synthase into the mitochondria matrix. 
Uh, I think one of them just animated by themselves, animated by themselves. Um, so what's going to happen is we have another hydrogen goes down and then more hydrogens go down and these hydrogens begin to basically turn this ATP synthase, which is, it's almost like a chamber. Uh, as a hydrogen goes down, it turns and it spins. And every time it turns and it spins, basically it helps regenerate ATP. So we'll have an ADP but get converted into an ATP, okay? So this is the electron transport chain. Now, if I were to ask you a question on the exam, um, what would happen if complex two did not work? Let's say in the presence of free radicals, because a lot of free radicals are generated in the mitochondria. So we, with all these electrons floating around and all this oxygen floating around, there's a lot of opportunity for um, mispaired electrons and oxygen to become a radical. And when a radical is developed, it can destroy all these protein complexes. It can destroy the membrane here, so it can cause a lot of damage. So what would happen if um, complex, or sorry, if protein complex two malfunctioned and it didn't work? I want you guys to think about that, all right? Because I might ask you guys that question on an exam, hint, hint, wink, wink. Um, the next three slides, um, are basically just summaries of what I just showed you on the electron transport chain, okay? So I'm not going to read these to you because um, it, it's basically the exact same thing that I just told you, but you can read these and get a little more detail. So this slide, this slide, and the next slide are all just reiterations of the animation that I just showed you. Um, to give you a better appreciation of eight... Oh, I don't know why that went that way. To give you a better appreciation of uh, ATP synthase, here's what it looks like, right? We have this positively charged intermembrane space because we created this proton gradient, right? And then in the matrix area, we have a more negatively charged uh, environment. And when these hydrogens go through ATP synthase, this rotates. You can see the arrow showing that it rotates. It looks like it's clockwise. And that rotation uh, also ch uh, allows this um, barrel to rotate, and that helps generate um, take ATP, ADP, and generate ATP. So um, that's just to give you an appreciation of how that enzyme enzyme works. Um, so that is all I have for you guys. Um, there are three more slides on this presentation that have to do with beta oxidation. And all I really want you to understand from beta oxidation is that when you have fatty acids, let me find the slide here, uh, that would be this one. When you have fatty acids entering into the cell, okay, obviously we have triglycerides. Triglycerides are stored in muscle cells, but they're also stored in fat cells. And when triglycerides are broken down, we get glycerol and fatty acids, okay? Um, fatty acids as I showed you they go into the Krebs cycle as well and they have to be converted into acetyl-CoA as well um, glycerol we really don't generate a lot of energy from glycerol so glycerol just kind of floats around in the blood and protein is the same thing protein also gets broken down here in the Krebs cycle which we, we had already mentioned um, this would be the oh, that's that's a typo this would be the beta oxidation process. And all you need to understand here is that when fatty acids are converted into acetyl-CoA, okay, they do, so that would be here, fatty acid, acetyl-CoA, fatty acetyl-CoA, they generate the same sort of um, reducing agents that glycolysis did and that the Krebs cycle did with pyruvate. So that's all I want you to understand is that fatty acids also go through beta oxidation in the Krebs cycle and they generate FADH and NADH as well okay that's the that's the big take-home message um, and that's it guys that's all I have for you you are now caught up I apologize the by the interruption for the phone call um, because we were in the animation section I'm not going to try to uh, edit that whatsoever I'm just going to leave it in there and you guys can laugh at me which is fine because I laugh at I laugh at myself often um, because if you can't laugh at you, who can you laugh at?
Now, just to kind of stray a little bit from that previous set of lectures, or previous set of slides that you guys just saw with all the animation and all that interesting stuff, um, it's important to understand that this hydrogen ion gradient that we build um, through the electron transport chain, right? So um, we can see that here's the matrix, here's the electron transport chain, which is embedded um, inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here is all those complexes, um, complexes that we have seen. And we know that ultimately these hydrogen ions, they're going to help create this gradient, this proton gradient, which is going to help essentially um, mobilize and activate this ATP synthase, which is going to help create ATP, right? So we're taking ADP and through the hydrogen ion gradient here, hydrogen ions are passing through this enzyme ATP synthase, turning um, the mechanisms here, it, it turns, it almost looks like a barrel and it's going to turn um, in 360 degree fashion. And that is going to cause ADP to be rephosphorylated to ATP and to have basically have ATP synthesis. So if we think back to the citric acid cycle, we think back to um, beta oxidation, we think back to even glycolysis, right? When we're creating all of these electron carriers that are NADH and FADH2, um, essentially they're bringing their electrons and their hydrogens down to the mitochondria where they're going to produce energy. So that is beta oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation in a nutshell. Now, embedded within the mitochondrial membrane is another protein that loves this, uh, this hydrogen gradient as well, which is called uncoupling protein, UCP. And what an uncoupling protein does is it allows the hydrogen ion to move through this protein transporter and this hydrogen ion is not going to generate energy like ATP synthase does, but rather it's going to generate heat. Now, there's many versions of these UCPs. There's UCP1, UCP2, 3, 4, 5. They all play slightly different roles, and they all kind of use hydrogen differently. Some of them will transport that hydrogen into the matrix. Some of them will transport hydrogen out of the matrix. But it's important to know that an uncoupling protein is going to generate heat where ATP synthase is going to use that hydrogen ion to generate energy. Now, why is this important? Well, in the animal kingdom, we know that this uncoupling protein is regulated in bears. That's why we have a picture of a bear here uh, during hibernation, right? So um, when the bears are up and walking, um, they are utilizing more of the ATP synthase mechanism with this proton gradient. And then when they're hibernating, they're using more of this uncoupling protein so that they can increase heat production during that hibernation. Obviously, he's surrounded by cold weather there, so thus he's going to use more of this protein. Um, it also should be noted that uh, when we are children, we have a very high amount of brown adipose tissue, and brown adipose tissue plays uh, has a is is very robust with uncoupling proteins. Um, so you can see here that on children, when we are first born, we have uh, quite a bit of brown adipose tissue. And then on the back, we have it here and here. And you can see um, through these images here where that brown adipose tissue is on a newborn, uh, uh, as indicated by these arrows. And then as we grow older, this brown adipose tissue tissue dissipates. Um, but not to the degree that we once thought that it did. So um, th because newborns have this brown adipose tissue, they say that that's why babies don't shiver when they're cold. Um, uh, unlike, you know, us adults who actually shiver tremendously when we're cold. Um, but research, especially in diabetes, is starting to show us now that what we once thought about this brown adipose tissue isn't necessarily true. Yes, it dissipates, uh, but we still keep quite a bit of it. And we are now finding that brown adipose tissue, which contains a robust amount of UCP, uncoupling proteins, in the mitochondria, um, plays a major role in diabetes and obesity and insulin sensitivity. So on this next slide here, I have uh, a paper that I just read from uh, American Diabetes Association, and it says human brown adipose tissue, what we have learned so far. Um, and what we had found is that uh, as adults, we actually do contain quite a bit of this brown adipose tissue, which we call BAT. 
Um, and we know that brown adipose tissue plays an important role in insulin sensitivity, and these things are inversely related. So what that means is the more brown fat we have, the more sensitive we are to insulin and the less likely we are to be obese. And the true is f the same for the opposite of that. The less brown adipose tissue we have, the more resistant we are to insulin and the more likely we are to suffer from obesity. So there is an inverse association between brown adipose fat and BMI, which is body mass index. You guys should all know that. Um, and we, uh, diabetes research has shown us that uh, brown adipose fat prevalence and activity, so not just its um, appearance in the body, but its activity. And what that would mean is if we go back here, even if we have it, are these uncoupling proteins doing what they should be doing and using this hydrogen gradient to produce heat? That's the question. So um, in people that are severely obese, they have lower prevalence and lower activity uh, than those people that do not have metabolic perturbations such as diabetes and obesity. So um, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there to, uh, of course, always bring a facet of disease uh, with health so that you guys can see the difference, right? And, and there are some um, research out there that show that exercising in a diabetic phenotype will change brown adipose tissue activity and appearance and will slightly increase it. And they've done a lot of study in rodents with that. So if we talk about how exercise is medicine, the way that American College of Sports Medicine wants us to talk about that, well, then the proof is in the pudding. If we have low amounts of brown adipose fat um, and we have uh, small amounts of uncoupling proteins, and then if we have a small amount of uncoupling proteins and the activity of those proteins is very low, well, then we can rescue that. Um, we can rescue that situation through exercise. And through exercise, we can increase expression of brown adipose tissue. We can increase expression of uncoupling proteins, and we can increase activity of uncoupling proteins. So um, again, we don't need medication. All we have to do is get up and get out and start exercising and make sure that the right things that we're putting in the body um, are the right things we should put in the body. So now we're going to talk a little bit about mitochondria regulation and also some of the jobs that the mitochondria does. Um, I was going to put an emphasis on these next two slides, but I'm kind of going to change my mind just for the sake of time. Um, and I'm going to get into exercise specifically. So if you look at your slides that I had given you, um, I was going to talk about this, which basically talks about how certain transporters are involved in maintaining the health of the mitochondria, hydrogen being one of them. Um, the thing to take away from here is that we have a lot of things that can cross the mitochondria inner membrane space. They are regulated through these ports or antiports or uniports. Um, but I'm not going to get into that just for the sake of time. Um, the next slide is the same thing. I'm talking a little bit more about that. I'm not going to get into that. And then on this next slide, it's talking about creatine kinase and the role creatine kinase plays in regulating mitochondria function. And on this one, I am going to talk about this a little bit because we have focused quite a bit, quite a bit on creatine, creatine kinase, phosphocreatine, ATP, ADP. And I want you to notice that, and I mentioned this earlier in one of the other slides, that creatine and phosphocreatine is allowed to transport into the outer mitochondria membrane. You can see this here, there are ports for that. Um, and they are allowed to interact with the inner mitochondria space and some of the products being created via the electron transport chain. So I do want to spend a moment to talk about this to, to basically appreciate and understand that creatine kinase not only works in an anaerobic capacity, but we can see here that it plays a role in uh, regulating mitochondria function. And like I said, there is a, here's that word again, there is a lot of crosstalk between these signals and there's a lot of um, communication between anaerobic and aerobic signaling. And if one of them falls, if one of them uh, becomes um, and efficient in doing its job, well, that's going to have a domino effect on other metabolic pathways, which is why I always talk to you guys about metabolic flexibility. If we lose 
the ability to cross talk between these between these pathways, then we lose metabolic flexibility, and then we start to experience um, metabolic perturbations and metabolic complications. So, what should we take from this picture? Well. You should recognize that we have the uh, electron transport chain here. You should understand the players here, right? So let's let's look at just a different version of everything we've been talking about. So here we can see that pyruvate and fatty acids um, essentially create acetyl-CoA, which then enter the citric acid cycle, right? We know that the citric acid cycle produces the NADH. We know that it produces the FADH2 that's going to interact here with succinate. Um, at this protein complex, and um, that's going to drive this um, electron transport chain, create a proton gradient in the inner membrane space, and then electrons are going to be transported across these different um, coenzymes and protein complexes, and then that's going to drive ATP synthase to create ATP, right? We know that. Well, there's also something embedded in the inner mitochondria space, um, and it, it kind of communicates a little bit with the um, uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria, and that is called mitochondria, mitochondria creatine kinase. So you can see it here, mitochondrial creatine kinase. Now, how does this crosstalk exist between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism? And what would be the uh, consequence of this mitochondria creatine kinase? dysfunctioning, right? So we have creatine kinase that we know exists in the sarcoplasm. And we know that in the sarcoplasm, when we start to uh, deplete ATP pools, then we upregulate phosphocreatine utilization. And we know that that phosphocreatine utilization uh, in conjunction with creatine kinase is going to basically resupply ATP, right? So we have ADP, activate phosphocreatine, activate creatine kinase, and then that gives us more ATP. Now, creatine kinase is allowed to transport into the mitochondria in the inner mitochondria space where it can active interact with mitochondria creatine kinase and it can create more phosphocreatine. So this guy here can take a phosphate. A phosphate can be uh, popped on and then once that phosphate is popped on, we have creatine kinase and creatine kinase can um, leave the mitochondria inner membrane space and then go back into the um, sarcoplasm to help aid in anaerobic metabolism. Okay, so these there is a crosstalk between these two very different mechanisms, and I think um, I wanted to show you that to show you how how much um, you should appreciate how these signals interact with one another. Now, the other thing I want to pose a question to you about is regarding aerobic activity. If we were to exercise primarily in an aerobic activity and therefore increase the mitochondria density, which means we have more of it, increase mitochondria efficiency, well, what do you think is going to happen to mitochondria creating kinase? we're going to increase its expression and its efficiency. So what does that mean? That means if we have more mitochondria, if we have more mitochondria, mitochondrial enzymes, and if we have more mitochondria creating kinase as an adaptation th for uh, chronic exercise, well, that means we're going to expand our anaerobic system because we have assistance from this enzyme that is going to help us create more of the phosphocreatine in the anaerobic system, right? And the same thing is true is if we stop exercising and we lose some mitochondria density, we lose some mitochondria efficiency, and we lose the expression of some mitochondria creatine kinase, that is going to directly impact our anaerobic capacity, right? So very fascinating stuff. And I do want you to look at this, um, this um, graph here and appreciate how these two systems uh, communicate or crosstalk with one another. So now in conclusion of uh, fatty acid metabolism, I'm going to go through a couple of slides really quickly because you can read these on your own. Um, I'm not going to read these verbatim because they're just facts. They're facts about exercise. So now you have all this information. I want to kind of get you thinking about how Everything you learned is impacted or impacts exercise. So there's a couple of slides here. 
um, that I want you to look at. Um, and I think they're simple enough for you to understand them without getting confused. So if we look at this one, as exercise intensity increases, there um, is a stimulus and progressive increase in epinephrine from the adrenal glands. Okay, well, that makes sense. And if we're trying to, what what has, why are the adrenal glands important? Well, because that's where your catecholamines come from. So if we exercise, we secrete more catecholamines. And if we secrete more catecholamines, then what is that going to do? Well, that's going to bind to those receptors on the adipose tissue and is going to release more fat because you have more of a signal, right? And then more fat is going to enter the bloodstream and then be metabolized during exercise. Um, you know that depending on exercise intensity or duration, catecholamine concentrations can increase 20 times above basal level, okay? So if we have just a natural release of 20 times higher catecholamines in a unexercised state, well then when we start exercising more and we increase intensity and we increase exercise time and increase exercise volume, well then catecholamine release is going to go up even more, which is going to have more of an impact on fatty acid utilization. Okay, So we know that the more catecholamines there are, the more stimulus for lipolysis there are liberating more fatty acids. Um, from the glycerol molecule, right? And we know that the glycerol mo molecule is the one that holds those three fatty acids together uh, in the triacylglycerols, right? So it's just stuff like this for you to put puzzle pieces together, right? And then I talk about CD36. What is that? That's the fatty acid transporter. We, we talked about that in quite a bit of uh, detail. So this one's super important. CD36 upregulation occurs rapidly. So after one or two days of exercise, we already get more of those transporter transporters and it remains elevated for three days post-exercise now if you stop exercising those cd36 uh, transporters will go away if you keep exercising your body will upload more of them okay um, if you increase time and duration of exercise and add a new stimulus and you start running uphill start running downhill uh, these things will impact cd36 expression all right so these are things that you can read on your own and I want you to put these pieces together. I'm not gonna hold your hand on these, okay? So there's several of these slides talking about the major players that we were talking about, CD36, carnitine, mitochondria density, um, and uh, that's it, guys. We finished um, beta oxidation, we finished uh, fatty acid metabolism. I know it was a lot. That's it, have a good day.